we go. Okay. You got it? Yes. Thank you, Nancy. You're welcome. So let's go to the first slide here. And uh, this is what I meant by a, a rather provocative quote. Uh, that comes courtesy of Henry Miller in 1944, 1945. He traveled the uh, breadth of the United States, stopping in major American cities, and he indeed stopped in Detroit. And he had a few thoughts about Detroit. Uh, but it should be noted that this thought is really about what he saw in terms of industrialization. Next. So, Industrialization is something that could potentially destroy uh, the very place in which uh, it has been created. Uh, industrialization that could indeed result in the destruction of the world. And in particular, I think uh, Miller was responding to Fordism, uh, the economic model of Fordism and mass production. And certainly one can only uh, see this with one's own eyes by going to Highland Park and noticing uh, across the street looking at uh, the remnants of Ford's Highland Park uh, Ford plant and the surrounding area, what Fordism hath wrought. Next. And uh, this is a photograph of mine and it simply, uh, I think falls into this realm of expression of uh, this environment that I've grown up in, uh, seeing this sort of ideal, uh, this sense that industrialization could lead us to uh, a utopia, it could, it could lead us to solving lots of problems, but that it's quite possible that it was baking a lot of problems into uh, the uh, societal fabric from the very beginning. But I remember what tomorrow was like. Next. So my father worked at uh, Fisher Auto Body 21. And uh, one of my experiences as a young child was wandering through this plant when it was uh, partially operational. So I was able to see a large portion of the plant uh, emptied out, uh, going into old executives offices uh, that were wood paneled with a kind of, in my mind, it was a, a moldy green carpet peeling up uh, from lots of water damage. But at that time it was unused while other parts of the factory were being used. Uh, my father's job at that time was uh, painting a, uh, a tar on the bottom of car chassis to stop them from rusting, uh, to prevent them from eroding. But as you can see, uh, there was a before to the Fisher Auto Body plant, but my experience and my upbringing was uh, the after. Next. Yesterday, I was capable of just about anything. Uh, this points to uh, a recent uh, move in my photographs in which I am uh, staging these photographs wearing these uh, heads, these factory heads that I'm constructing, uh, printing the photographs up as a very small uh, four inch by four inch uh, uh, prints, then scanning them in at a high resolution and blowing them up to 30 inches. But before that, starting to draw on them, starting to scratch them. And I think increasingly, I would like to draw into the image, damage the image a little bit. Damaging the image is a very important part of my process. Next, please. So this is Fisher Auto Body 21 today, uh, as some of you may recognize on the left, the after. And then you can see it before. I actually saw it somewhere in between that space before it was completely uh, eroded, uh, but not quite from its glory days. Next. I used to live here when it was new. Next. Uh, my grandmother, who uh, recently passed last week at the uh, ripe old age of 103, actually worked at the Packard Motor Company uh, in the 1940s. Uh, and my grandfather, her husband, worked at Park Davidson Company on Jefferson. Next. So my family history reaches out actually across the state of Michigan, all the way up to the Upper Peninsula into uh, copper mining in Calumet. Uh, my family touches upon a number of different uh, industrial activities that uh, basically created, uh, was a component of the fabric of creating the modern world as we know it. And, uh, but my memories always come, always come down to my experience as a child of Detroit. Uh, we moved out of the city uh, when I was a very young age into St. Clair Shores. And my impression of the city was always one of instability, of decay. Uh, next. 
that there was a cloud emerging from that city. And in fact, uh, that the glory days were gone and that industrialization uh, was something that was slowing. Uh, there was a different narrative that was always told about the destruction of the city that I think was uh, related to uh, race for those who engaged in white flight. But the real story had to do with industrialization baking in the decay of that metropolis from the very get-go, uh, that there was a, a fundamental um, uh, deconstruction uh, caused by the very construction of industry. Next. Uh, this idea of systems, of hidden systems, uh, working their way at eroding a, a, a way of life, at eroding a, a, a a geographical location of eroding a social fabric are very important to me. This is the earliest piece that I'll be showing to you this evening uh, from uh, my time at the University of Iowa in graduate school, uh, Mundus Subterraneus Suburbium, number two. And it's meant to show this kind of underground system, uh, this interconnected system of waste, next which is shown in this model. Uh, the drawing ended up becoming an etching and that etching was installed in a box construction that I created. And the etching actually uh, is a system of uh, commodities, of products, of waste, of bombs, of fat, of rubber, of pills, pharmaceuticals, barrels, uh, little rivers, next. And when you approach the piece, there was a central uh, magnifying lens that you look into. And back in that time, I was uh, more prone to grand guignol gestures of making the piece as gross as I possibly could. So there is a condom in the middle stacked with mud and then a small fly on top of that uh, to sort of build up this notion of decay right in the middle that you're looking through. The houses were sourced from Monopoly, they're the larger houses. And then I made a, a companion piece to this, which has the smaller houses with, with another sort of underground system of decay. Next. Uh, in addition to the city of Detroit, I have to point out that uh, with the experiences that I had been thinking about in relationship to my upbringing and, and my family's uh, relationship to industrialization. I had a grandfather that introduced me to a lot of printed material, questionable printed material, thankfully. Uh, Dear Dead Days uh, by Charles Adams is a rather bizarre book that my grandfather had on hand. I had no idea what to make of it as a child, but as I grew, I would look at this, I would return to this book, and I would admire its, its, its rather distressing uh, sense of humor. Next. And then my grandfather would purchase copies of Mad Magazine for me uh, in the 1980s. This was a very important uh, part of my upbringing. I would keep copies of this in my desk uh, in school. And it actually taught me how not to trust the world as it stands, how not to trust what is advertised, how to even start thinking politically. There's this wonderful fold in in the back of an issue that I had from 1983. Uh, that results in uh, basically advertising the ousting of Ronald Reagan. And this is in a magazine uh, collected by uh, mostly boys in, uh, in elementary school. And I was one of those, thanks to my grandfather. Next. Uh, the Johnson Smith and Company novelty catalog. As I said, my grandfather worked at Park Davis, uh, which is on Jefferson. And next to Park Davis was uh, the largest purveyor of novelty and gag items in the world, the Johnson Smith and Company factory. And uh, they didn't have a storefront, but my grandfather would go in there after his shift finished at work. He was a pharmaceutical inspector for Park Davis. Uh, knowing my grandfather, that distresses me a little bit. But uh, after work, he would go over to Johnson Smith and he would load up with novelty items, bring them home, introduce them to my mother and my aunt. Uh, but he kept a stack of these catalogs. And uh, to this day, I have a few of them. And there's something about the impossible descriptions that accompany each of these gags, which never worked. Uh, they, were, they never delivered on what they promised. And that has stayed with me. Next. Uh, also, these uh, various ads from uh, gardening magazines. My grandfather built his own outdoor fly traps for his gardens. He didn't order these, 
Uh, but looking at this material, this printed material and, and what was advertised finds its way into my work as I try to deal with uh, issues within the world that I live in. Next. So you see the flytrap finds its way in this piece from 2017. This is a screen print called Post Truth Feed. And uh, there are a number of those uh, fly traps. Uh, and then you have a little area at the bottom uh, containing plastic flies. And then a collection of the flies at the bottom within the framed piece itself. And what's interesting about the fly trap, uh, which relates to my reading of uh, social media and the social media feed, is that once a fly enters, lured by the meat within the, the trap, uh, the fly can't see its way out because of the way that the uh, opening has been painted. Uh, it, 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 its uh, eye, its compound eye, can't sort out where the opening is, so it stays within that trap. Next. And this is a little detail of the piece in which you have handwritten, this is not this, that is not that, and you can see that there's a fly on the inside of the glass casting a shadow uh, onto the print, and then you have these little uh, shadow imprints of the uh, fly traps between the actual fly traps. Next. Uh, a novelty salesman sample case by the SS Adams Company. This particular image led to the piece that you'll see in the next slide. Uh, this print was uh, developed at uh, the Signal Return print shop in Eastern Market. I was invited to participate in a wonderful project uh, in which artists were paired with uh, nonprofit organizations to create a print in support of that organization. And uh, I was, uh, I have to say, Signal Return went out on a limb for me uh, because I proposed something that was satirical uh, that needs a little bit of parsing uh, out. And what I wanted to do was to satirize and to target what I felt were, were false development promises that were flooding into the city. And the Build Institute, which this print was in support of, is actually uh, in support of small businesses. So they're the right model, but I wanted to present something that was about the wrong model. And it seemed to me that pairing that with a novelty uh, salesman's case was ideal in terms of the promotion of these products that never delivered. Uh, but what I did was I paired up each item by number with uh, how these items are meant to uh, hoodwink uh, the unsuspecting population of a particular metropolis. Uh, and this, this took a lot of work to create this piece, uh, but thanks to Lee Marshallonis, uh, an incredible master printer, we were able to figure out how to make this thing work. Next. So here's a little view into some of the process. You can see that uh, the central image is uh, carved uh, from a uh, linoleum um, mounted on a block, so it's a relief print. <clears throat> but around that print is a lot of type. There was so much lead in that tray. I had to hand pick and space all of this type. Uh, it took a great deal of effort just to, uh, to bring this over to the press, uh, but we did it. And uh, I, you know, being in a letterpress shop, I thought the right thing to do would be to put as much type into one print as humanly possible. Next. That print uh, led to a, a sculpture, next, which is the creation of an actual uh, false development promises sales case. And I uh, made this to be used in a live performance that was live streamed into a uh, gallery in Chicago in which uh, the performance served as an infomercial. And I think the idea of a sculpture and a performance coming out of a print is very important to me. It's not the only time that I've done this because for me, print, there's a performative element to print. The idea of creating a matrix and projecting an image, copying that image, repeating that, and there's a performative gesture. And later on, there will be another print that I'll uh, show that deals with that idea of print and performance. Next. Uh, following up on that piece, this was uh, another proposal that we decided not to do, and I did the uh, for the signal return print, uh, but uh, I held off on this to create this as a, as a screen print. So this is a project which is in, in the wings, but it's something that I am going to make uh, very shortly, uh, a build a city kit. 
which is uh, not quite the false development promises, but it deals with this idea of these tall, slender uh, uh, structures that have been going up. You can see how the, the skyline in Manhattan has been drastically changed by these impossible uh, constructions, which if you read um, the New York Times and the architecture critic for the New York Times, you'll see have been made very poorly and are not holding up structurally, but have a great deal to do with ego, as a lot of architecture sometimes does. Uh, next. The source for this image um, is this girder and panel building set. Uh, back in the 1950s, late 1950s, the Kenner Toy Company created an entire line of toys that responded to a modernist craze for building. And you could purchase a, um, a uh, highway kit. You could build your own highway. You could uh, purchase an airport kit. Uh, and it was all sort of promoting this idea of development. And it's very important throughout, as you'll see throughout my projects, to find uh, a, a form, a printed form, in this case, uh, something that for me uh, comes out of an alternative uh, uh, cultural history of print. So it's not print that's made as a fine art form, something that you won't see necessarily hanging, uh, meant to be hanging in gallery walls or collected but it's the kind of printed material that was trafficked in popular culture. So I will look at packaging, I will look at uh, catalogs, printed ephemera, and these uh, are examples of the kind of material that I go to in my work. Next. Uh, good example of that is the Swanson TV dinner for this piece that I produced last year, Modest Plates. And Modest Plates is a riff on Jonathan Swift's well-known satirical essay, A Modest Proposal, in which he proposed that the Irish poor eat their children to solve uh, the hunger problem. And uh, in this case, this is uh, aimed at the working class as a working class meal, which may in fact contain trace elements of the working class within the meal. And at the time that I was making this, I was thinking about the various reports coming from Amazon's automated factories of the kinds of injuries that workers were sustaining uh, and uh, the uh, lack of time that they could uh, uh, get off from work and, and the kind of compensation that they needed. Uh, but it seemed to make sense to me to riff also on the idea of small plate culture, you know, uh, going into restaurants and paying a very high price for a very small amount of food. Um, but riffing on that in a very different way and going back to the ultimate small plate, which is the TV dinner and aligning that with uh, Swift's uh, satirical essay. Next. This is a uh, very fresh uh, project. This is something that I just finished called Prime Fatalism. And I did my, my Facebook project and I've now done my Amazon project. And uh, this is meant to mimic uh, the form of the uh, uh, 18th or 19th century broadside. Next. When you read it, however, uh, it indicates that uh, after you purchased this broadside, you were meant to destroy it. Next. And it says, even if you are not to take one of the matches which is provided uh, with the print, and strike the strike pad, which is also on the print, which I did purchase from Amazon, the strike pad, uh, then essentially you will still uh, have this print succumbing to the natural law of entropy, the slow breakdown of its materiality, the filing away of it into perpetual storage for non-viewing, the tossing of it into a dumpster once fulfillment has passed next. By famine, flood, fire, or pestilence, either way it shall be destroyed sooner or later, just as all things and creatures will be. And there are your two matches and there are your strike pads on these coffins. And uh, I, I'm very fond of art that acknowledges mortality and impermanence. Uh, I think uh, when I was an undergraduate student at Wayne State University, I spent a lot of time uh, creating pieces that riffed on the memento mori. In particular, I was very fond of um, 17th century, 16th and 17th century Dutch art that referenced this notion of impermanence. And I find myself coming back to this in a lot of the work that I'm making right now. Next. 
Uh, the form of this print and the coffins that it makes use of uh, go back to uh, this broadside from 1828, 184 black coffins. Uh, these, uh, there were a series of black coffin broadsides produced by those who were uh, not wanting to see um, um, Andrew Jackson uh, return to the presidency and wanted to uh, make note of all of the atrocities that he had committed. Uh, this particular print, however, is actually uh, a satirical uh, British broadside, which is riffing on the American black coffin uh, uh, broadsides that had been produced, the anti-Jackson broadsides. And this British broadside is basically saying, you see, uh, look at everything that your president, your fearless leader is essentially, uh, you know, all of these bloody deeds. This is what you get for, for, for leaving the monarchy behind. Uh, but what's fascinating is uh, the form of this broadside, what are called the mourning, M-O-U-R-N-I-N-G, the mourning borders, these thick borders, and then the coffins. We could go back one more, uh, back to the, uh, the previous image, please. Uh, it should be noted that in my broadside, the blue is the Amazon Prime blue, and the typeface is, in fact, uh, the Amazon typeface that you see uh, used all over the place. And uh, I'm, I'm forgetting at this moment, but uh, along with the idea that they produce the Kindle, uh, they also produce this typeface, which references the idea of, of flame uh, and fire as well. And I wish I could remember that uh, name of the typeface at this moment. So it seemed appropriate to me to create a print uh, that referenced Amazon, and in some of the language I do that as well, that uh, needs to be destroyed. Next. Next. And this takes me to uh, another print that deals with repetition. Uh, I find myself creating a number of images that deal with uh, the repetitive manufacturing of an image, which I'm sure there is no mistake uh, that since I come from the land of uh, mass production uh, here in Detroit, the assembly line, that I'm very interested in finding imagery and developing imagery that also deals with a form of mass produced consumption. In this case, in uh, 2016, I believe, maybe it was earlier, I had seen a, a uh, exhibition at the Art Institute of Chicago called Altered and Adorned, and it was about prints that uh, were used in some form. They were prints that uh, you would interact with, they would unfold, they would have to be cut. Uh, and I came across this marvelous print, uh, Schluck Builder, edible prints from 1740, in which you see uh, the Virgin Mary and you were meant to cut these out and consume them uh, as a form of communion with water. And in some cases you would also take these and bake them into bread and then uh, eat them next. It made sense to me that I had to do a Schluck Builder for Henry Ford. Uh, this is a print from 2017, a letterpress print, uh, printed by uh, Lee Marshallonis at Signal Return. And the comparison of the early, the, the, the need to build off of the early Schluck Builder and produce this, in part was inspired by uh, Aldous Huxley's Brave New World. In Brave New World, uh, Huxley draws that line uh, from Ford to a new religion. And throughout the novel, uh, there is reference not to Lord, but to Ford. Uh, I have not had anybody purchase this, cut them up and bake them into baked goods, but I would like to see that. Um, if need be, you can purchase two and one could be used for baking and one could be used for frameable art, but I'm interested in seeing that happen. Next. Uh, Fordlandia, another piece made after uh, a failed project by Henry Ford, uh, in which he established a uh, industrial city off the Amazon in Brazil to produce rubber. Uh, the only problem with that is that his scientists, his um, agriculturalists didn't properly study the, uh, the land uh, to understand how to actually cultivate rubber. And on top of that, he imposed a kind of Midwestern um, way of life on those who, uh, on the Brazilians that he hired at the plant. And so there was an uprising 
uh, by those who worked for him. He never stepped foot there, but the project uh, fell apart in glorious fashion. Uh, I understand that Werner Herzog is currently working on a mini series uh, that takes place in Fordlandia about Fordlandia next. And there's a view, uh, an aerial view of Fordlandia from 1934. If we could just jump back one more time, please. Uh, the sign, it's, it's a painted sign. It's a painted sign uh, with the idea that there would be a population of 10,000, which was what uh, Ford projected. Uh, the architecture of the town was by uh, Albert Kahn. Albert Kahn designed a hospital, factories, uh, Midwestern houses, which were based upon uh, the housing in Alberta, Michigan, in the UP, which is a small town, a small sort of a company town that Ford started for the milling of wood for all of the uh, station wagons that had wood. Uh, and the color scheme on the houses were this green and white, but I've dripped this uh, varnish over to yellow it. And I also left the sign unfinished. It was this projection for something never to be. Next. And next again. Uh, I should say something about signs. Uh, I had discovered in 2017 that my grandfather, my father's father, not the uh, grandfather that worked at Park Davis, but a different grandfather was a sign painter in Detroit in the 1950s. Um, I believe they called them um, uh, wall dogs uh, was the slang uh, that they would uh, go up on uh, either up on high or at street level, above street level, and they would paint signs on the sides of buildings. And my grandfather did that. The longest time I never knew that. It was just not a piece of information provided to me. But suddenly my interest in, in text and typeface and advertising um, became apparent. There, there was something there. There was some, uh, my grandfather was perhaps speaking to me uh, from, from a distance. Uh, but we never spoke about that in person and there's no documentation of the signs he painted. Uh, so it became important to me to commune with his work and to uh, sort of project uh, into that world of sign painting and all of the work that was to follow next. Continuing to take on Ford uh, in, in 2018, I decided to start creating a number of these large scale signs on cardboard. Uh, they're drawing, they're painting, they're sculptural in the sense that they have a relief element of stacked cardboard. Uh, this is, as you can see, the captain of industry. Next. Uh, if you look at this, uh, though, this is a, a little uh, uh, plastic Henry Ford that you can, uh, for $3, I think, now it's $3, it might have been raised, you can produce at the Henry Ford Museum. Uh, and it somehow makes sense that you can receive a Henry Ford made from a mold uh, that uh, shoots out into this little bin and smells of this plastic that, that burns your nostrils a little bit as soon as you, as you pull it out. And I used to, I had one of these when I was a child, uh, but the pose of the figure in my Captain of Industry is taken from that moldorama of, uh, of Henry Ford. Next. Uh, Death Auto, this is from the same series. Uh, and, uh, you know, it's interesting. I had a friend uh, when I was growing up, um, when I was in high school, who worked at Dunkin' Donuts, manufacturing donuts. Every morning he would make the donuts. And uh, it got to the point where his clothes smelled of donuts, his hair, his whole being smelled of donuts. And, uh, and I would go in and I would occasionally get free donuts from him, uh, but he would never eat donuts again. Uh, he just had zero interest in ever touching another donut. And I sort of feel that way a little bit about the automobile. When I briefly moved to New York City, uh, I felt that I was freed of the automobile, that I could ride the subway, which I enjoyed uh, for many different reasons. Uh, and, you know, I'm not somebody who goes to the, the dream cruise. I'm not somebody who uh, fetishizes the automobile because I feel like it had an impact on my upbringing and on the city that I live in, in ways that I connote the automobile with death. Uh, it might be a bit extreme, next. But in my mind, it makes sense because I was too close to the making of, of the automobile and it left a kind of psychological residue. So this gives a good idea in this image that 
uh, these pieces are shaped, these cardboard pieces. And each of the cars, in this case, this turns out to be the, uh, the Kennedy death car that's on display at the uh, Henry Ford Museum. Each car is enamel that's made of cardboard, but that enamel has been allowed to pucker up. So it's a very uh, distressed surface. Next. Uh, this piece uh, was included in the show that Claire referred to in, in her introduction, This Must Not Be the Place. Uh, this is, uh, the show is This Must Not Be the Place You Thought It Would Be, but there was one piece in the show, this uh, 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 painting on paper uh, titled This Must Not Be the Place, which references the following image. Next, please. Uh, this image on the left is taken from a book, Les Fines du Monde, The End of the World, published in 1919. And it's a, uh, a novel by uh, Blaise Sendrar, who uh, controversially uh, in this satirical story casts uh, the figure of God as an, as an industrialist, as a capitalist uh, who smokes cigars and wants to work out a bargain with uh, uh, Mars, the god of war in order to uh, make some money that he, that he hopes to funnel back to humanity. But of course, it's a, it's a double-edged sword. Uh, with this deal that's being made, uh, it will also bring about the end of humanity. But Liget did the illustrations for the book. And uh, the illustrations are actually uh, created using this method called pochoir, which is a stenciling method, a kind of early screen printing method. And it made sense to me to reference this book, Les Fines du Monde, and to go back to uh, the colors of modernism and, and to consider the content of, of Sendrar's book in the making of that previous piece. Um, next. Uh, modernism and progress is an issue that I've returned to frequently. Uh, there's a large body of work that I've omitted from this uh, talk that deals specifically with modernist architecture, uh, but I will show this piece, Radiant Neighborhood, which is a blueprint, a cyanotype blueprint. I had to track down uh, an old blueprint machine since those are no longer in use by, by most who, you, who create blueprints. Uh, they're now digital blueprints. And what I did was I based this image, I drew the image out based upon Le Corbusier's plan for a, uh, the radiant city, La Ville Reduce, uh, the ideal city. And uh, Le Corbusier was really the, the architect who thought about the notion of housing projects, of how to create equitable living for the poor. Um, and, but a lot of the architects that followed his suit who ended up creating these uh, ideal uh, housing projects uh, throughout France, in particular in Marseille, led to some serious uh, problems of inequality. And uh, particularly in, in 2017, 2016 and tw 2017, there were a number of uh, uprisings within these um, uh, housing projects by migrants who had been living in and around them and, uh, and really the idea of the housing project, you could see this in very physical form that uh, Corbu's ideas had failed. So I wanted to create a radiant neighborhood and in, impose these uh, neighborhood fires on top of his plan. Next. Uh, print and performance. That print actually came out of this particular performance uh, in 2014. I had made a series of those uh, blueprints uh, in which one copy of the print would be on a wall, one would be on the floor, and there were small modules, black modules, in which uh, two of the performers in the group that I worked with uh, would then place them on the map according to my guidance and according to what they're seeing on the wall. And it was uh, this very quick process of trying to match up that ideal plan. And then it ended with all of the, all of the uh, modules being crushed, turned to dust, and then placed into a vitrine, which was based upon one of uh, Le Corbusier's structures, uh, high rises meant to uh, house the poor in his ideal city. Uh, and then the top was sealed so that you would just have all of these remnants held within that. Next. Uh, neighborhoods, uh, your modern dream house. At the time, I was a little anxious about uh, searching for a house in Detroit with my partner. And uh, when I was away at a residency in Virginia at the Virginia Center for the Creative Arts, um, this is when I was in 
right after learning of my uh, grandfather's history as a sign painter, I started making these advertisements uh, for the Rotland Manufacturing Company, which is a made up company. And it's the idea of, of the possibility of manufacturing nothing, um, that uh, the dream house is maybe more complicated than what you might think. It seems to be cheap and easy, uh, but it may not be either of those things. Next. That also applies to the notion of parcels, cheap land parcels that you can build upon yours now. Uh, but are they really that cheap? And what will you end up building upon them? Next. You may notice that the language of these pieces uh, certainly has a modernist slant. And at the time I was looking at a lot of Italian futurist uh, paintings and drawings. And um, the Italian futurists had uh, at the onset, you know, the, the futurists began working in 19, the movement started properly in 1913, which is the same year uh, my house that I live in now was built, but it was also the same year that Henry Ford started the Highland Park uh, plant. And uh, at the onset, uh, there was this idea of pushing for industrialized modernity. You know, they, they celebrated war, they ended up becoming fascists, the uh, Italian futurists. And so they have a very complicated history with this idea of modernism. And what I wanted to do was to uh, puncture nostalgia a little bit, use their imagery, uh, but diffuse that with my own history and memory of the remnants of modernism next. Big box closeout. Uh, these forms are that you see on this piece in this detail are based upon all of the Kmart's that you would see closed, uh, littering the landscape, which in my mind always appeared like these these little battleships on the horizon. These concrete uh, uh, battleships with these occasional flourishes left over from the '60s. Next, uh, decommissioned public schools. This is part of a, a triptych of. Uh, uh, failed infrastructure uh, uh, within the city of Detroit. Uh, so this is a uh, set of schools that have been closed down. Next. Forgotten libraries, Carnegie's ghosts. Uh, you know, Andrew Carnegie had funded all of the, this remarkable, remarkable library project across the United States in which uh, uh, towns uh, had these uh, public libraries constructed, and there are a number of them in the city of Detroit. Um, some of them have been reused, and uh, some of them are still libraries, and there are a few that are abandoned. Uh, there's one in particular in the Island View neighborhood in Detroit, which this image is taken from, which uh, uh, I had hoped to uh, purchase, actually, with my partner and convert into something, but the city of Detroit never responded, and that library, sadly, is still decaying uh, to this day with its roof collapsing in. Next, unearth streetcar rail. Um, of course, we're aware of the queue line. Um, during the construction of the queue line, you could see uh, uh, some irony in the removal of all of the old uh, streetcar rail uh, that was buried underneath the streets of the city of Detroit. And one day I'd been passing down Woodward and there was a pile of all of this mangled streetcar rail. And I placed the timeline of the life and death of Detroit streetcar uh, from 1892 to 1956. <clears throat> Next. This is a piece in the collection of the uh, Detroit Institute of Arts now, the used factories piece. Uh, the profiles of the factory are based upon some factories here in Detroit, uh, some from the uh, Rouge and uh, the one at the, at the left hand side is taken from the Highland Park plant, the central structure. Um, used factories for sale, really empty shell. And, um, and a lot of these are still empty and, and, and falling apart. Next. Uh, vintage union handbooks, uh, the story of the union uh, and its, its rise and fall is, is a sadness and it's certainly been a conversation within my family during my upbringing. Uh, the word brotherhood can be barely seen in the central uh, part of this where you see these horizontal lines, the uh, word brotherhood is faded. And much of this uh, is faded, uh, where I've gone back in and I've started to sand away the image. Next. 
Rotland Manufacturing Company all new wound work gloves in which wounds have been built into the uh, gloves themselves. One size fits all realistic factory wounds only in black. Um, next. Uh, this is a, a, a more recent uh, photograph. Uh, I went to work, but I did not get there in which uh, you can see me wearing those uh, wound gloves and uh, also wearing this um, uh, boiler, what's called a boiler suit. And uh, the, the head, the factory head, it's a factory head that's been removed that I'm holding as if I'm holding my own head uh, is based upon early Russian constructivist uh, 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 sculptures. Actually, they were uh, drawings for sculptures. Next. And this need now to go back and to look at Russian constructivism for a series of pieces that I made um, were important to me in the sense that uh, this particular piece, uh, the heart of the working class was based upon a design, uh, a series of pieces uh, designed by Gustav Klutzis. And uh, they were meant to advertise the rights of the working class, uh, the need for solidarity. Uh, the need to come together and to, and, to, and to lift the working class. But here you see a kind of uh, uh, distorted uh, uh, variation on a heart uh, with some tar, some tar material. Uh, tar is uh, a loaded material for me. As I said, my father painted tar on the bottom of car chassis, but my grandfather, uh, the pharmaceutical inspector, before he rose up in the ranks, uh, to become the pharmaceutical inspector. He was in the basement at Park Davis putting creosote uh, on telephone poles because Park Davis had developed creosote. So that's a material that's very, it, it finds its way into a number of pieces I've done over the years. Next. Uh, this is an example of uh, the work of Gustav Klutzis, uh, who worked with his wife, Valentina Kuligina, in creating these um, uh, they, they were meant to sit on the street and you would have these rotating discs and there would be recordings that would announce uh, uh, speeches by Lenin. Uh, so they were agitprop and they were meant to uh, deliver messages right there on the street. Uh, and from this image, you can see in the next image, the form, uh, the general layout uh, that I took. Now, uh, it's a little difficult to see in this image, but this is a relief form where you have thin pieces of cardboard that are stacked. Uh, but the message of my image is ironically subverting the, uh, the messaging in Klutzis's work. Uh, this is the wound of the working class, next. The messaging here, rather than uh, saying workers of the world come together, Workers of the world give up, go home, find something better to do. And there is this stylized wound uh, with gauze that's uh, affixed uh, to the piece. And, um, you know, it's, it's not that I, that I want to destroy Russian constructivist art. There's a part of me that is a very sad idealist. Uh, I, I believe in the rights of the worker. I'm quite moved by Klutzis's imagery. I'm very moved by Russian constructivism. Uh, but I want to have this conversation about what happened to that, that artistic energy that believed that it could change the world. What happened to uh, artists coming together to form a collective that believed in uh, collective agency, action, uh, the idea that, that art, you know, was an action, uh, a social action. Next. Uh, there were a series of signs that uh, the constructivist Redchenko uh, made for a department store in Moscow. Uh, in some cases, they advertised cigarettes. And there was this moment in which uh, modernism and cons Russian constructivism uh, aligned itself with this idea of selling. And I've always found those to be fascinating images. And in 2019, I created a series of going out of business signs. Uh, and these are also in relief. It's very shallow relief in which you have these forms stacked. And some of the pieces appear as if they're being taped on uh, in order to hold, be held onto place. Uh, next, final days. Um, uh, 
stacked tape at the bottom. This is all charcoal uh, with a little bit of white ink. And I should say something about materiality here, this idea of using charcoal, the idea of using uh, cardboard, very important to me. It's the notion of an ephemeral material, uh, that which is discarded. Uh, the charcoal is like a dust that has settled on the surface of something that has been made that perhaps was new at one time. Um, I recall, uh, you know, in the 90s uh, here in Detroit, uh, there just seemed to be a patina on a lot of uh, uh, streets that were closed. If you went down Woodward and you saw a lot of closed stores with plywood and that plywood would age and you would see windows aging, there was always this, this, this patina. But what fascinated me about the patina, uh, this dust that was in the air, was that it's as if it were equally composed of particles that were positive and negative. You know, there was an optimism uh, that you, if you saw through it, you could see what was there, what was once there. Um, and there was a, there was a, a whiff of, of history, of, of, of possibility uh, in those particles. So it, it was a strange duality that one, and I think you could still experience that really in the city. Next. Uh, another piece based upon uh, one of Rochenko signs, total liquidation, entire store on sale now. Um, that plane with that surface, these were, I, I consider these in many ways to be sketches, small drawings that led to something much larger where I started to push that surface more. Next. Um, today I made nothing. What's interesting about the idea of the factory head is the factory head uh, may be the cause of uh, what is not being made, uh, may be the cause of not being able to go back to that place where the factory head once was. Next. Uh, not hiring, no job, help not wanted, no need to apply. 2019, this is a uh, relief print with hand coloring. Uh, again, riffing on this, um, Modernist language uh, with the uh, angularity that carries with it a sense of possibility. Next. Uh, vintage time cards. Uh, I, in some ways, when I was working on this print, I felt that I needed to insert actual time cards in here, uh, which are no longer used really. So I had to go onto eBay and track down uh, some vintage time cards. And I am of the age where at one point I used to punch into work. Uh, I don't know uh, if that really happens anymore. I, I, I don't know anybody who uses time cards anymore, but again, this printed artifact uh, that interests me, but the primary form of this piece on the next slide, please, is actually taken from the vanity uh, ballroom, uh, which still stands on Jefferson Avenue on the east side uh, before you enter into Gross Point. And uh, with this sort of incredible reference to Mayan architecture, uh, this is a ballroom that my grandmother uh, frequented. She uh, relayed many stories to me of seeing Benny Goodman uh, and uh, Duke Ellington and the dance floor uh, is mounted on springs so that it moves a little bit. Uh, but it seemed to make sense to me to take that sign and to reference this idea of the working class and, and their leisure activities and the idea of clocking out and, and going to this place. Now, uh, not everybody looking at the print would know that, but it was important to me uh, with a lot of these projects. The references aren't necessary for every viewer that comes to my work, but it's very important for me as an activity to, uh, to engage with uh, this language of the past to arrive at the image that I'm making. I have, to, I have to go back into and look at, into history and look at a historical model in order to create the, the work that I'm making. Next. Um, with everything going on uh, in terms of my immersion in my family's history, with uh, understanding my, my grandfather's activity as a sign painter, uh, looking into the language of sign painting, making signs on cardboard, uh, it seemed natural to me that I had to paint something on a wall uh, in the city. It's just something that I, that I had to do. So I proposed this uh, mural in the form of this very tiny sketch. And that sketch uh, became the next image. Uh, this is on the side of Holding House, which is on Michigan Avenue. If you've ever been traveling down Michigan Avenue, it's across from the high grade uh, deli parking lot. 
And, um, and it became necessary for me to create a large scale version of what I had been doing on cardboards. This is about 20 feet high by 50 feet wide. I can safely say it's the largest thing that I've ever made. Uh, next. The uh, surface of it, though, is comprised of a relief element, which harkens uh, to the cardboard work that I'm doing, that there are these appliques. But this was also a way of relating to the architecture, because underneath those crates are windows, and I had to deal with them in some way. So I wanted these empty crates, uh, and then uh, you would have three crates that have these uh, beautifully colored crate lids on top of them next. When you are inside of this structure, which was a gallery and is now a bookstore, it's 27th letter books, uh, at a certain time of day when the light comes through, it colors the glass. And that was my, uh, my own version of uh, the Ronchamp Cathedral that uh, Le Corbusier designed, where you have the colored glass with the light coming through. So this is my, this is my Detroit version of that. Next. And then I created a sign for the sign. Uh, with my made up company, the Rotland Manufacturing Company, in which the letters form a kind of figure uh, with the head, arms, and, and legs. And then I just had to add a little uh, uh, joke of no package deals, all items as is. Next. Uh, more recent project. Uh, last year, I was invited to participate in an exhibition uh, celebrating the 100th anniversary of the building of Orchestra Hall. So I decided to look into the architecture of C. Howard Crane. And I created this image, which is an architectural fantasia of a number of his structures, including the, uh, the Fox Theater, a theater called the Alhambra, and part of the early, uh, earlier version of the Majestic. Next. And that became this piece, this relief, which is uh, cardboard and wood with charcoal drawing uh, on top of it. Uh, but it has to have this other element that the architecture becomes a sign, a sign that advertises its own sale. Next. This is a little view into the process where you can see uh, how I'm building that relief with strips of wood and stacking that cardboard and then starting to apply the charcoal, which again is that dust. Um, and I will, there's a kind of glue charcoal mixture that, I, that I've created, but then I also have a liquid charcoal that I'm applying, uh, which is sort of like a mud. And then in the end, there's a, a little shaker that I have with some hosiery over the top in which I'm shaking this dust down and then I will spray it to leave it in place. Next. This is the second part of what was a, what is a diptych. So the first dealt with the idea of the movie Palace, which uh, C. Howard Crane was a major architect of these dream uh, spaces where you could go to see uh, films like the Fox Theater, but he was also an architect of movie houses. So the movie Palace becomes a billboard to sell these small abandoned uh, movie, ho uh, movie houses. Next. The movie houses were meant to be uh, smaller theaters for the working class. Initially, the movie palaces were meant to compete with uh, symphonic halls, uh, orchestra halls, opera, uh, uh, operas. Uh, but then after a while, they realized uh, that they would also open their doors to uh, entertainment for the, the working and middle class as well. This is the Fine Arts Theater, which is originally the Addison, designed by C. Howard Crane. And this is a study that I did after the Addison, which you saw in those little movie houses on the previous piece. Next. Uh, here's a little side view. You can see some of these movie houses and the black marquee, uh, the blackened marquee in uh, relief. Next. This is a quote by uh, Orson Welles that's always interested me in relationship to his film, The Magnificent Amberson, which is really about the decline and fall of an automobile manufacturing family, a dynasty, and uh, how it relates also to, uh, how that family relates to the town and how their downfall uh, relates to the downfall of the environment that they helped build up next. So I've begun thinking about a Magnificent Amberson's marquee project. This is a little watercolor uh, and casein study. Casein is a paint made with milk and it, it provides these fascinating textures that watercolor works with. 
Um, and I don't know where this is going yet, but knowing that the Magnificent Ambersons as a film project itself was also taken away from L, uh, uh, Wells and cut up and given a false happy ending, it seems that something has to happen to this marquee. The marquee is based upon the actual marquee for the premiere of the Magnificent Ambersons uh, when it was advertised as a, as a great new Hollywood project uh, in a, at its opening, but then shortly after was mangled by the studio. So I'm thinking this might be cut. It might be joined with a different structure. I'm not sure, but it will eventually become a relief. Next. Uh, over the summer, this is a, a very large painting on paper, three and a half feet by 10 feet that I, that I finished at the Gentile Residency in Wyoming. And it deals with uh, a film called The Wild Bunch. As I was out in the West, I was thinking about uh, the mythology of the West, particularly in film. And in this film by Sam Peckinpah, in, in many ways, it was about the end of the West. And in fact, in that film, it's made very explicit that the automobile has been invented and, and horses will no longer be around. And there was also this notion of the death of machismo uh, in, in the American Western. Uh, it's a very bloody, violent film that underscores this notion of impermanence and, and death in the West. And it made sense to realize this as a large marquee. Next. Uh, I also created this marquee, uh, Disney's Song of the South, Whitewashed. One of the things that I found in my research of the Fine Arts Theater on Woodward uh, was that the last film to play at it in 1980 was Disney's Song of the South. And I was, uh, uh, I found that to be a remarkable thing since it's a, it's a racist film. It's something that Disney has tried to eradicate from their catalog for many years now. And in fact, after uh, the, uh, um, uh, wave of, of uh, killings, murder of uh, African-Americans at the hands of police, uh, there was finally an outcry, you need to remove your, uh, the ride that references Disney's Song of the South from, from Disney World, from your theme park. And they finally did that last year. Uh, but I think it's important to respond to this notion that there has been cultural output aligned with uh, capitalism, aligned with money uh, that creates a product that advertises a false historical narrative. And I think this is the first in a series of marquee pieces that deals with the whitewashing of history, of American racial history um, in terms of its film. Uh, Gone with the Wind would be an example. Uh, so this is uh, the first of that series, The Song of the South, in which the marquee is literally whitewashed. Next. Uh, the last group of images I'm gonna show this evening um, are a series of very small paintings, uh, roughly five by five inches, some a little larger, some a little smaller, of matchbook covers, pocket advertisements, pocket signs uh, that uh, were used widely by Americans uh, in the uh, uh, post-war era. Uh, and they advertised, uh, you know, ways to make money, ways uh, that really, when you go back and you look at these matchbooks, it was advertising a way of life. Uh, I started making these matchbooks uh, coincidentally on January the 6th. I had the PBS News Hour on when the Capitol riot was unfolding. I had planned to start these, but I had only planned to make about three, and I ended up making 50 over the course of about four, four or five months. And they're very bitter. Um, maybe some of the most bitter work I've ever made. Um, and uh, I just need to purge a lot from my system. So let's just take a look at some of these next. I think they're fairly self-explanatory. They seem to be immersed in water. So, uh, you know, the, the, uh, their match-like qualities have been uh, nullified, next. Next. And I found as the series went on, I started to distort the surface more and more, disrupt them, cover them up, um, erode them, decay them. Next. And there's this wonderful uh, op-ed piece in the New York Times in which the author, whose name I forget at this moment, it might have been an unsigned editorial by the Times, but indicated that uh, modern American society was entering uh, a stage of particular uh, American democracy was entering a stage of paranoid senility. 
something that stuck in my mind. Next. So this is what I'm working on now. This is in the studio. They're large matchbooks. They're really large matchbooks, but it's the interior. It's the matches, which become strangely figurative in some way. Um, and, you know, the messaging is not something that I believe in per se. You know, it's, it's meant to uh, make one pause. What do you mean, torch it all, watch it burn? There are certainly those out there that believe that sentiment, a dangerous sentiment, but it's why the American Matchbook Company is the name of the company upside down at the bottom of the uh, matchbook. And these will not have any color in them, by the way. Uh, just gray, uh, sort of ashen. Next. And that signals the end of, of this talk. And if you're interested in seeing more of my work, uh, uh, some of the other uh, media that I work in, feel free to visit my website at ryanstanfest.com. Uh, I'd like to thank uh, Nancy for powering through. I have no idea what happened, but it seems that in lieu of the subject of my talk, that it makes sense that the works got gummed up. Uh, but thank you for sticking with me and, and I hope you enjoyed. And if anybody has any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. And this is Claire jumping in too. Yes, everybody, I'm seeing a couple people entering comments in the chat. Thank you very much. And somebody called Chris says the matchbook work will be shown at Hatch Art in Hamtramck in March. So we should all go look and look and see that show there. Yes, Can they I will be in uh, Iowa first. There's going to be a show at, a, at a, a college in Iowa in January as well. Wonderful, wonderful. And um, so please, if you have questions, write them in the chat window. I'd be happy to ask uh, Ryan this. My, I'm actually kind of... My breath has been taken away a little bit by all of this, Brian, frankly. It was Thank one you, thing to, to, well, you're welcome, but it was one thing to sort of walk into the Wayne State show and go slowly as a person, as you know, just absorbing a single piece at a time. But to see this as a trajectory and to see it um, develop and to get the references side by side, there's an incredible, um, consistency, there's an incredible uh, continuity. And yet the way you're using your references and the way you're responding to your references is quite different from what I've seen other artists doing, you know? Mm -hmm. I mean, there's a strong interaction with all these key moments in the avant-garde. You know, the people who are ahead of the army, the avant-garde, the first wave of the army is the, that old definition of, of, of what the avant-garde is, it's the first wave. And you're engaging with this historical avant-garde, this historical first wave in a, in a very, very different way. So. Um, well, one of the things that I, that I didn't speak of in the talk, which is sort of, um, I've been reflecting upon this more and more recently is that um, once I graduated high school, I became an assistant to a uh, sculptor, uh, David Barr. Uh, some of you may know his work. Uh, he he had designed the uh, with Sergio de Giusti the labor monument uh, in Hart Plaza the gear element and the layout. Uh, but I had worked for David for, for fourteen years as his assistant, so painting steel sculpture and uh, uh, sort of putting uh, retouching his modernist house that he designed with an architect out of Chicago who had designed the original. Uh, contemporary museum before they moved to their their newer location and so I had received a schooling uh, of all of this modernist work that David was particularly fond of Russian constructivism and David had a very strong belief in the ability of art to be on the street of, of, of a modernist public sculpture that could inform that could elevate and um, take one out of the political at times but you know and I was working very differently at the time and, and I didn't take the same trajectory he did. Um, I didn't grow up at the same time he did. He came of age in the 50s and 60s and uh, came out of an engineering program and believed in modernism. And, and everything that I was witnessing was through a different set of eyes, you know, which was uh, uh, what happens when all of this starts rusting. And in fact, I had to consistently repaint David's sculpture and remove the rust from those pieces. 
and I, I can't help but believe, and I'm still, I still receive message one, messages once in a while from people who know that I worked for him asking me, how do we fix this? <laughs> and, and, and I think that in some ways the pieces are meant to fall apart ultimately, despite, you know, the entropy is, is, is baked into it as they are on all things. But I think that uh, that work that I did with David is informing what you're talking about, you know, I think it's uh, it came from my experience with him uh, in, and, and the city, of course, those things collided in my mind. Yeah, I know that's that entropy that you keep coming back to. I'm seeing that Wendy has a, a question for us um, specifically. Do you think our modern computer world has even more seeds of its own destruction than the old industrial world? And are you planning on any work uh, besides the ones you've already got, like the great Amazon Prime coffin shapes? Well, uh, it's interesting. You know, it, it, there's there's a debate if we're in a post-Fordist time or if we're in a neo-Fordist time. You know, neo-Fordism means that we're just continuing the, the model of Fordism, but in a different um, package. You know, that everything that we're dealing with with Amazon is a continuation of of, of uh, Fordist, uh, the Fordist economic model. But, um, and, and I think uh, in, in, in some ways a lot has changed and in many ways things have not changed. You know, when, when you hear the complaints of workers uh, working at Amazon factories and, and the constant struggles we experience of trying to achieve workers' rights, uh, we've sort of forgotten past struggles and, the, and those past struggles are coming back now. Um, you know, I have no idea how I would respond to that. Uh, I, I'm, I think in some ways I'm already starting to think about it, but uh, in terms of that Amazon piece, and thank you for the positive response to that, uh, I would like to make more prints that are meant to either be buried. I'm, I'm thinking of working with a paper that has seeds embedded in it. Uh, where you can bury a print. I know this is a conservator's nightmare that I'm asking people to destroy the work that I make, but the idea of also folding, uh, I like the idea of somebody eating my art, of, of indeed burning it. I didn't have time to make a video. I wanted to make a video of the Amazon piece where the matches are pulled off and you do burn it. Uh, but uh, I, I'm very interested in art that, that relates to a sense of mortality. And, and it's interesting because the thing I never agreed with with David was, and, and there may be some sculptors out there, I'm not knocking what you make, but I've never been a steel sculpture guy. You know, I've always believed in the idea that uh, ultimately there is an impermanence and we are impermanent and it makes sense to make work that reflects our own impermanence. So I'd like to make more prints that respond to that. Would have been interesting if the Dutch had made memento mori pieces that had some decay mechanism built into them. <laughs> well, you know, I love the fact that you bring those up because, in a sense, those were about an ideal, um, and this ideal of of this memento mori of this uh, thinking about this memory, this recollection of death. And yes. in a way, you know, as you said, so much of what you're doing is a is a memento mori, but it isn't idealized in the same way. It no. it is. I mean, it, in some of the lines in the constructions, those echoes of the precision of the clean modernist style, that '50s streamlined style, uh, which goes back to the '30s, really too. But that idea of the streamline ideal. I mean, there is that precision, but as you said, you're working against it and you're using the charcoal, you're using cardboard. Oh my God, that's the conservator's nightmare, Ryan. Yes. <laughs> I, you know, the idea of, I don't, if you put it on acid-free paper and you printed it at Signal Returns, which everybody knows is such a fabulous place, so do go on visit Signal Return. But, you know, if you're using acid-free paper and good ink and all that other stuff, I don't care as a, as a, as a curator. But when you start putting the things on, brown cardboard it's like yeah, oh yeah. what are we going to do with that and yeah. that's where that's where you know for those of us who are trying to preserve things recognizing the artist's intent and that the idea of impermanence and the idea of decay is part of your work that's something we always as curators have to struggle with 
Paul so Clay worked got, on cardboard. There's a lot of Paul Clay on cardboard. There's Paul Clay. There's all kinds of stuff on cardboard. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, I've got a couple more comments here. Uh, well, Nancy, thank you. Do you feel you are a product of the American dream? How do you feel about that statement? A big question. <laughs> I think one has to understand the dream in order to in order to respond to that. And I don't think I've ever understood the dream. I think the dream was it was a marketing term. <laughs> and I think when you when you dig down, I don't know because for a lot of people, they you know the the, the dream never happened. Uh, so I don't. Um, uh, yeah, that, that, so you have to you have to unpack that one. I, I don't believe in the idea that there is a singular dream. I believe that uh, there is this notion that uh, individuals are trying to achieve something and sometimes they're wrapped up in believing what others want them to, to do for them. And sometimes they arrive at what they want. Uh, but I've certainly seen that in my upbringing, my family history is the struggle between uh, finding the self uh, within this, um, you know, this this desire to work for uh, the company, you know, and achieve some, achieve the bottom line versus, you know, who, what are you left with at the end of the day in terms of an identity, in terms of what you want to do, you know. Uh, a lot of people that I know in my family, after they retired, they didn't quite know what to do with themselves. It was all about that work day. Um, you know, I had an uncle who worked at Stroh's uh, and um, uh, on, on Gratiot. And uh, I think after he retired, he had no idea what to do with his work. It was just, it was about that day, that work day. So it depends upon, it's, I don't know what the American dream means. For, depends upon who you ask. I'm sure whoever was running the plant would say, oh, it's, it's a dream for sure. You know? Yeah. Yeah, and yeah. I'm just going to read a couple, there are a couple other comments just saying that Fordism is tied to the American dream. That's from Nancy. And then Vince yes. is saying that it's this failure that in, of the American dream that informs your disenchanted idealism, the fact that it ultimately <laughs> didn't del deliver. And I want to stress that I still, despite everything, um, it's it's the fact that there's a little idealist living inside of me. <laughs> this is why I'm I'm uncomfortable and want to make some of the work that I make, uh, or all of the work that I make. Um, you know, I don't I don't want to live in a constant state of outrage. Uh, th there's still a part of me that wants to try to make better. Try to make better. I find that um, my activities. Uh, in the political realm are, are an attempt to do right. And then my work within uh, the studio is trying to sort through this history and sort through all these complicated feelings. Uh, I'm not, I don't feel like I'm making political work. I feel like it's work that is about the political and that it's gray, it's unresolved, it's uncertain, it's agitated, but it's not telling anybody what to think, you know. Um, I, I try not to do that, at least. Oh, I lost the picture again. So I agree with you entirely on all of that. And we have another comment here from Todd saying, how, if at all, has seeing our landscape littered with now hiring signs affected your work? So that's, uh, Ryan, if you could respond. Yeah. Has, has this shift, I mean, this last three months, four months, five months, where suddenly we're in this strange moment of inflation in, of now hiring. Suddenly everybody realizes that people can't work for peanuts. Right. That, that they can't work for the wages that they have been working for, but we haven't figured out where we go from here. So has yeah. it changed your work or do you think that might echo in new ways? Well, it was interesting because when I was showing that piece, uh, workers of the world give up, go home, find something better to do. <laughs> I feel like uh, suddenly that that took on a new meaning. I mean, I think when I was making those closed cinema pieces, I had no idea that within a matter of months, cinemas everywhere would be shuttered for quite a long time and in some cases closed up for good. And at the time that I had made uh, the going out of business signs and the pandemic started, shortly after, uh, because they were shown at uh, Simone de Sousa's uh, edition, uh, who, by the way, published a wonderful catalog. Simone published a great catalog, which is available at her gallery. 
But uh, those signs, people were messaging me and saying, my God, this is what's happening right now. So it shifts. It goes mm -hmm. back and forth. Um, and I think that there are some currents that will just not, I mean, we will probably always go through cycles of, of, of profit and loss, of inflation and stagnation. I mean, there's, there's going to be these waves um, and uh, correctives put in place and then the corrective failing. Uh, so there's a kind of long game here. It's not all about, you know, it's very rare that I'm, I think the matchbooks are a little different where I was responding to some things that were bothering me in the moment. Uh, they're very quickly made, but for the most part, um, a lot of my work has a bit more distance from whatever the news is at that moment. All right. Well, I just have, uh, Jim has said uh, one more comment, terrific talk. You make a teacher feel like it was worthwhile. Thank you, Jim. I, Jim was my uh, my first uh, Jim Palace, ladies and gentlemen. He was my first um, uh, professor uh, after I left high school and went to Macomb Community College for a spell. So well, I have Jim to thank in part. Yes. So thank you, Jim. And I'm going to wrap up at this point. I do thank you all for keeping with us. I hope you all found this just as stimulating and um, rich and deep as uh, we uh, we have all done. And I have somebody, Donald has just put a hand up. Donald, did you, uh, if you can type it in the chat, otherwise I think we might need to wrap up. Um, all right, hang on. All right, well, I think, um, Anybody can contact me, email me, I'm, I'm always open to studio visits, uh, you know, if you're in the neighborhood, uh, but, uh, you know, feel free to, to reach out to me if you have any questions. Great, thank you. I love and, the chat. And thank you again to the friends of Prince Drawings and Photographs, and everybody come down to the museum, we're open, uh, reservations, uh, and as always, free to the residents of Macomb. Oakland and Wayne County. So thank you to everybody. And thank you so much, Ryan. Thank you very much. Thank you, everyone. Have a good evening. You too.